Okay, so we have looked at complex numbers and some of their basic properties and some applications. Right? Most of the material that we have covered so far has been in the nature of recall. We have all uh, presumably seen these ideas at some point. Uh, so starting from this lecture, we will look at functions of a complex variable. Right? So we are familiar with functions of a real variable, you know, notions of continuity, and differentiability and so on. So we will see that you know the extension of these ideas to functions of a complex variable. You know they come up with with some uh, you know special constraints uh, appear naturally when we are working with functions of a complex variable. So we will discuss the notion of continuity in this lecture. Okay. So a complex variable you know has a real part and an imaginary part. So it's really a you know. Uh, it's made up of two independent real variables, right? So if we want to make a function out of a complex variable, so in general, so I mean, it, the resulting answer will be also a complex number. So the resulting, uh, you know, the uh, output of this operation would have a real part and an imaginary part. So it's customary to write it as, you know, f of z is equal to, you know, u of uh, u which itself is a function of both the real part and the imaginary part of the original complex variable and the imaginary part of the function f of z itself is a you know function of both x and y so we write it as f of z is equal to u of x comma y plus i times v of x comma y right so if you know if u and v themselves are you know in some sense you know nice functions we might expect that uh, there is, uh, you know, something smooth about the overall function f of z. So, but we will see that, you know, special care is required. So, you cannot, you know, simply put in any arbitrary u and any arbitrary v and expect that the function f of z is going to turn out, you know, uh, with you know, very nice properties which we, we, we care about for su such functions. Right, so so let's analyze this carefully. So uh, to do this, we'll first look at the notion of continuity. Right, so what is our intuition about continuity from functions of a real variable? So it's the idea that uh, you know there is nothing uh, you know, very jarring in the moment of you know, function. As you change the real variable, so the value that the function takes at nearby points is basically the same, or you know small changes in uh, you know the, the the input will give you only small changes in the output if you wish to think of it like that right so uh, so x is your uh, independent variable and so then y would be a dependent variable and so small change in x will result in uh, a small change in y right so that's the idea of continuity intuitively so when you're looking at a function for complex variable so we say that a function is continuous and yes at a point z naught if the, all these three conditions hold. First of all, you know the limit of this function f of z at you know as z approaches z naught must exist, right? F of z naught itself must be very defined, and this limit z to z going to z naught f of z must be equal to f of z naught, right? So this idea of taking the limit uh, of a function is is also something. Uh, you know, which requires some uh, thought when we are working with, with complex functions because, you know, the limit here is something that you, you can approach a certain point z0 in infinitely many directions. So if you are working with a real variable, you know, x, uh, you can approach a point x0 either from the right or from the left. And so you would expect that the value of this function is the same whether you approach from the right or from the left. But here, so it's a little more... Uh, 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 involved. So the condition here is that the limit should be the same if no matter in which direction you approach this point z0. And so if, if that is true then the limit exists and not only is it, uh, is it enough for the limit to exist, the value of the limit must be equal to the value of the function itself at that point and then the function is continuous. So this seems like a very reasonable you know definition, re requirement for continuity. Right, so 
let's look at uh, a few examples. So suppose we consider you know, a simple function like f of z is equal to z squared, right? So indeed, intuitively, we would expect this to be a continuous function at all, you know, all uh, points in the complex plane, and indeed it is true. So if you expand it out explicitly and write out the real and imaginary parts, right? So you, you write it as x plus i y the whole square. So the real part is going to be x squared minus y squared, and the imaginary part is going to be 2xy. So it's straightforward to work this out. And so if you check the continuity of this function at the origin, so suppose you approach the origin along the real axis, right? So so you imagine taking a, a point like epsilon plus i0, right? So you are on the real axis, so it's only epsilon that is a variable, so i always has you know, zero along with it. And so the approach, as we approach the origin, so this is the limit that we must consider, limit as epsilon tends to zero of f of epsilon plus i zero, which is equal to limit epsilon tending to zero, just epsilon square, right? So, uh, you know, the argument is just simply epsilon. And so indeed, as epsilon goes to zero, this is going to go to zero. So again, if you approach the origin, but along the imaginary axis, we would consider the point like zero plus i epsilon, you know, slightly away from the origin, but along the imaginary axis. And then you do the same exercise again, limit epsilon tending to zero, f of zero plus i epsilon, which will now give you, when you square it, you get a minus sign. But since you're taking the limit epsilon going to zero, it doesn't matter whether you have a positive sign or a negative sign, so the value is zero. So indeed, you could have approached this origin in, in any of the other directions as well, and you can convince yourself that it would still give you the same answer. So, so to do do that, you consider something like uh, you know a displacement of r in along a direction theta. So, your your uh, uh, z itself will be r times z to the i theta, and then if you take the limit r going to zero, you will see that you know as you take the limit r tending to zero, this function will take this value r squared and cos, cos squared theta minus sine squared theta plus you know you have i times 2 cos theta sine theta right so another way of seeing this is simply to write it as r squared e to the i 2 theta right? so that's you know this is just an expanded version of r squared e to the i 2 theta and indeed as r goes to 0 it's going to be 0 regardless of which direction you approach it from so theta can be anything and you will still get the same answer so indeed the limit exists and it is, uh, so the value of f of z at 0 is 0. So indeed the function f of z is continuous at z equals 0, but this is, you can verify that this function would be continuous everywhere, right? By, uh, you know, carrying out a similar exercise, but at a different point. So let's look at another example. So if we consider a function like f of z is equal to z divided by z star, right? So we have seen that z star is the complex conjugate, right? So complex conjugate is if you have, uh, you know, the, the complex variable is x plus i y, z star would be x minus i y. So if you expand this out and write it out explicitly, so you can write this as z times uh, um, z squared divided by z times z star. So multiply and divide through you know, numerator and de denominator. You, uh, you know, multiply by z, so then the denominator becomes mod z squared, which is the same as x squared plus y squared. So then, numerator has, uh, you know, it's basically z squared, which we just worked out. So you have the numerator is x squared minus y squared plus i times 2xy. So you have the real part of this function is x squared minus y squared divided by x squared plus y squared, and the imaginary part is 2xy divided by x squared plus y squared. So now, if you try to approach the origin, right? So let's approach the origin for this function along two directions. Suppose we start with on the real axis. If we consider a point like epsilon plus i0, and we approach the origin, so this limit will be epsilon tending to 0, f of epsilon plus i0, which will be just, you know, limit epsilon tending to 0, epsilon squared divided by uh, epsilon squared. Right. So in this case, um, so the imaginary part is just zero. So if, so y is zero. So the imaginary part of this function itself immediately vanishes, and then you're just left with epsilon squared divided by epsilon squared. So as you tend epsilon to zero, it doesn't matter. It's just going to go to one. 
But on the other hand, if you had approached along the imaginary axis, then you have to take this same limit epsilon equal to 0, but of the function f of 0 plus i epsilon. 0 plus i epsilon means that y is, uh, you know, epsilon. So x is 0. So you have, you know, once again, uh, the imaginary part is gone, but the real part now is going to be, you know, minus i epsilon squared will just give you, you know, epsilon squared, but the denominator will give you minus uh, epsilon squared, right? So, and therefore the answer overall in, in the limit of epsilon equal to zero is just minus one, right? So therefore we see that the, this limit of, you know, this function at the point z equal to zero, as you approach zero from two different directions are different, right? It doesn't even matter. You don't have to consider some other direction. You could if you want, but you know, establishing that any two directions, you know, taking the limit gives you different values immediately tells you that there is no continuity. The function is not continuous at that point, right? So, so this shows that you have to be careful with, you know, functions of a complex variable. So we have looked at two examples. One, a very simple benign type of a function where indeed continuity is clear, we might have intuitively expected, and indeed arguing carefully, we have seen that it is continuous and then we looked at another example where continuity is not possible at the origin and so this we saw by looking at taking the limit carefully from two different directions and seeing that the values are different. So we will build, build on this notion of continuity and we will come up with ideas of what differentiability is and you know what conditions differentiability will impose upon you know, the function and so on. So that's coming ahead in future lectures. That's all for this lecture. Thank you.